Evoking the name Elden Ring is in no way a trivial matter. This game of the decade for some stirred many discussions about its world, its gameplay, its bosses or its lore. But in truth, the discussion surrounding Elden Ring should not solely focus on it being a good or a bad game. Elden Ring's success is to be found elsewhere, that is, in the unique effects it has on the player, in the uncanniness it brings to the minds of those who dare entering its world. And this video aims to uncover the qualities of the game that are rarely, if at all, mentioned. Now, the first step to understand the lasting impact Elden Ring has on us is to look at Franz Kafka and its short story, The Borrow. The Borrow was written by Kafka in the last winter of his life, between 1923 and 1924, and it tells the story of an anthropomorphic mole obsessed with his borrow. The latter is a sprawling and tentacular structure, composed of multiple tunnels, rooms, and even a castle keep where food is sheltered. The protagonist revels in his achievements, having built an elaborate shelter that could bring him peace and satisfaction, except that it doesn't. As the story goes on, the main character grows more and more unsatisfied at the sight of his home, obsessed over its architectural imperfections, its half-baked entryway, and many other details that make what was a lovely place once a dreadful one. His distress is so high that he ends up leaving his borough and spending the next few weeks looking at it from the outside. Eventually, he comes back and when he does, everything seems new again. His home now looks ravishing and could finally bring him some rest, except that it doesn't. A sound makes its way to the borough, a small and significant sound that will grow louder and louder in the mind of the protagonist who's imagining that a beast is making its way to him with the intention of invading his space. Although nothing ever happens, and no beast ever presents itself, the borough has now become an unhomely home, a place that acts both as a shelter and a menace. Kafka's story is a striking example of what is called the uncanny. The uncanny is defined as that which is strange, mysterious and unsettling. The uncanny has to do with a sense of strangeness, mystery or eeriness. It concerns a sense of unfamiliarity which appears at the very heart of the familiar, or else a sense of familiarity which appears at the very heart of the unfamiliar. With Kafka, the most familiar place we may think of, home, becomes unfamiliar and no longer safe. And this is precisely what also characterizes Elden Ring. The point of this essay is to show how the identity of Elden Ring is closely intertwined with the uncanny. From its story to its level design, gameplay and multiplayer system, from software's latest game blends in the familiar with the unfamiliar, embracing its legacy while carving its own path. In many ways and as we will see, playing Elden Ring is like entering a new world we always knew. In Elden Ring, you're a tarnished, one of the many warriors who lost the grace of the Earth Tree and were banished from the lands between by Queen Marika. This exile was meant to make you and other tarnished warriors wage wars in foreign lands and grow strong. But during your exile, Queen Marika shattered the Elden Ring, a magical item that changed the lands between and put it under the influence of a god named the Greater Will. The destruction of the ring plunged the whole domain into chaos, and so the Earth Tree becomes you to come back, retrieve the Elden Ring, and become Elden Lord. For the purpose of this essay, I won't dive into the lore of the game, to avoid spoiling it, but also because some of the events recounted in the game remain unclear and subject to interpretation. What I would rather do is focus on the base plotline, which already gives us a lot to think about. And the most important element here is the idea of exiles the tarnished are facing. The plot of Elden Ring sees us banished from our land to then come back to it. But the land changed, as it is now plagued by conflicts and disorder. The world of the lands between we can see at the beginning of the game is not the same one our character used to know. For them, the familiar became unfamiliar, and what was called home now has a taint of menace. 
The premise of the game is such that it lends itself to the uncanny, making the vast domain of the lands between a strange, threatening place that is no longer what it used to be. The exile of our protagonist allows From Software to give the game's world a unique atmosphere that feels dreadful and enchanting at once. To explain this further, here's an instance of the uncanny explained by Sigmund Freud. Once, as I was walking through the deserted streets of a provincial town in Italy, which was strange to me, on a hot summer afternoon, I found myself in a quarter the character of which could not long remain in doubt. Nothing but painted women were to be seen at the windows of the small houses, and I hastened to leave the narrow street at the next turning. But after having wandered about for a while without being directed, I suddenly found myself back in the same street, where my presence was now beginning to excite attention. I hurried away once more, but only to arrive yet a third time by devious path in the same place. Now, however, a feeling overcame me which I can only describe as uncanny, and I was glad enough to abandon my exploratory walk and get straight back to the piazza I had left a short while before. The uncanny Freud felt comes from him circling back to the area he left just a moment ago, coming back to the same street again and again, however familiar it may be resulted in feeling uneasy and apprehensive. The uncanny then coincides with the rediscovery of something we already know, with a sensation of déjà vu that the tarnished must be feeling when coming back to the lands between. Not only does the game's world evoke an uncanny feeling, it also provides no escape from it. While Freud recounts succeeding to leave the street he kept seeing, the whole world of Elden Ring is that street. It is in this world that we play up until the very end, and while one of the multiple endings in the game may offer solace from this situation, the fact remains, Elden Ring's playground is an uncanny place. I would like to address one thing before going further. While Elden Ring may be related to the uncanny, so too are the other games by From Software, and especially Dark Souls 3. In that game, we travel to the same world as the first Dark Souls, except that this time around, things are bleaker, and the world seems to come to an end, and you can see Jacob Geller's video on this. Dark Souls 3 embodies well the idea of a familiar place turned into an unfamiliar one, for the protagonist too comes back to a world they already knew, and so does the player who played Dark Souls 1. What Elden Ring brings to the table is a sense of the uncanny from two different perspectives. While the protagonist of the game, after their exile, stumbles upon a familiar world that feels unfamiliar, the player, on the other hand, stumbles upon an unfamiliar world that feels familiar. For the player, the lens between is a new playground they've never seen before. There is a paradox here between what the character and the player are experiencing, the former coming back to a known world that feels new to the latter. But that paradox, like the one that makes the games both dreadful and enchanting, is far from being a failure. On the contrary, it accentuates the uncanny effect, because the uncanny resides in the ambiguity of such contradictions. Now, how does the uncanny translate into gameplay? There's a lot of similarities between Elden Ring and the other Souls-like, so much so that Elden Ring is often perceived as quote-unquote open-world Dark Souls. Not only is the combat similar, but some of the locations and enemies we encounter in-game are either identical to the ones from past entries, or strangely comparable. But this, again, creates a unique experience for the player, confused as to what they're seeing. Here's an example. I encountered this boss, and while finding it, something felt weird. Like I already saw that enemy somewhere, but not exactly. The truth of the matter is that this enemy looked like the Capra Demon in Dark Souls, and to be frank with you, it was just as painful to fight. But its changed appearance along with the new environment around it made me feel uncertain about its identity. What we feel as players when fighting these types of opponents is not the same as when we fight brand new opponents we're seeing for the first time, because here we cannot help but wonder about the identity of what we're facing. These enemies seem identical to past ones, but not quite, and the impossibility to determine for certain their identities participate in making them uncanny. There are neither old enemies nor new ones, 
there are repetitions, doubles, and we tie back to the idea of déjà vu mentioned earlier. For Freud, the double is a frightening entity in that it promises immortality by reproducing oneself, implying that one can go on and live forever, but it also signals death because the double takes over its original self. Such a notion threatens the logic of identity, which, in turn, contribute to the uncanny. On a similar note, the ghosts we often come across in Elden Ring and other Souls-like also act as doubles. They are manifestations of other players who are tarnished, just like us. And just like us, play a character who went back from exile to roam around in the lands between. The partial presence of other players does not solely result in a sense of eeriness since it also provides solidarity among players. Whether it's messages left on the ground by other players or their spectral apparitions, these occurrences signify that someone like me was there, doing what I do, thinking about the same thing, finding the same enemies. While Kafka shows the gruesome reality behind that which is most cherished and intimate to us, Elden Ring shows that behind the most daunting situation lies a common ground we all share. Anything new and frightening Elden Ring throws at me has been dealt with by someone like me. And this is comforting. If the double can show me how insignificant I am when being one among many, it can also show me what is possible to achieve. No matter how dreadful a situation may seem, the uncanny calls us to recognize how much of ourselves there is in the unknown. When discussing about the uncanny, Freud relates it to the German terms Heimlich and Unheimlich. Heimlich means homely, familiar, mundane, intimate, friendly. But the term also implies secrecy, concealment, something being withheld from others. Unheimlich, in such a context, is the name for everything that ought to have remained hidden and secret and has become visible. This is precisely what Elden Ring often does. It brings what was invisible into light, by pulling the curtain off of what was hidden. Souls-like are famous for containing secret items and hidden locations, but Elden Ring goes a step further thanks to its open-world design which offers a much bigger scale to everything. Upon discovering a platform in a tree, a player not accustomed to From Software games may have no clue as to what will happen. While an experienced player will probably expect to end up in a room containing a secret item and a few enemies. Regardless, nothing prepares you for this. This optional area which is the equivalent of a whole level in a Dark Souls game, is a secret that requires no presence, no player to explore it, and it's a secret of such a scale that it leaves players in awe, both fascinated by the place and apprehensive of it. The uncanny sets in the moment a veil is lifted from this secret area, because something massive is being lifted before our eyes. Of course, we could argue that an area like this one is not fully secret, since the game excels at giving incentives to find it. That being said, it remains optional and, at the time of writing, only 43% of the players who bought Elden Ring on Steam beat the boss of the area, which means that a lot of people missed it. Secret areas aside, there is one last thing I would like to talk about. Another unheimlich element in Elden Ring. And that element is death. Death is something of an obsession in From Software games. Whether it's with the idea of dying twice in Sekiro, or the ominous prepare to die in Dark Souls, which is one of the cornerstones of the franchise. That obsession over death, apart from being related to how difficult these games are, may also have to do with the fact that death is at once the most familiar, since everything that lives dies, and the most unfamiliar thing of all, the most unthinkable and unimaginable concept that we fail to understand. The necessity to die and die again to defeat bosses implies a relation with death in which the latter becomes trivial, almost commonplace because it is part and parcel of the gameplay loop. But at the same time, 
We keep witnessing other players' death when touching the bloodstains lying on the ground, signaling that someone else died there. By witnessing the deaths of others, we confront something that can and will happen to us, which is unnerving, especially when we stumble upon a myriad of bloodstains, signaling that a tough encounter lies ahead and death along with it. Such a spectacle succeeds in setting fear and dread in the heart of players. And that's not all. Bosses too can feel uncanny. Many times their appearance flirts with the horrific and even the way they die verges on the unsettling. Consider, for instance, Moggit's death, one of the first boss encounters in Elden Ring. After being defeated, he says this. I shall remember thee, tarnished, smoldering with thy meager flame. Cower in fear of the night. The hands of the fell omen shall brook thee no quarter. When saying, I shall remember thee, tarnished, not only does he speak to the player from a different and unknown realm that is death, but his words also resonates in the air, and with them, a hint of menace, that feels as such because of the lingering menace death represents. To put it simply, speaking from a place like death confers a strong authority to Morgit's words, and no respite for the player. Even the brightest victories of Elden Ring can cast shadows. Kafka's story, The Borrow, ends with the protagonist in disarray, unable to know what the sound he keeps hearing is and where it could possibly come from. Is it a beast coming up to destroy his work? Or is it a multitude of insects trying to dig a path for themselves? Or is that sound the result of his own delusion? There are no answers to these questions, because Kafka's text is said to be unfinished, and only leaves us with a puzzling last sentence, but all remained unchanged. These last words are the most terrifying ones of the short story. What remains unchanged is not the safety of the protagonist's household, but more so the never-ending uncertainty of its safety. To put it differently, the fact that there is no change indicates that no resolution can be found, and the one thing that remains secure safe, certain, is the uncertain. With Kafka, the promise of what a home can bring us collapses when the place where one settles is also a place where things do not settle. There is no end to the uncanny. It's a feeling we all experience and cannot do without. The borough's identity can only vacillate between two different aspects, just like Elden Ring's identity is stuck between Dark Souls and something novel. That said, if Kafka gives no hope to his character, Elden Ring embraces its own status. The game does not shy away from the overwhelming shadow cast by its predecessors. It integrated and digested its legacy in order to create something unique. The rediscovery of a home we've known for a long time. A home whose furniture changed and whose walls now feel tainted. But maybe this is the uncanny reality of anything we dare call home.